Assalamu alaikum and welcome to yet another episode of Sky is the Limit. My name is Fahim Bangush and today, like every other program, we have a very special guest. Today's guest is Mr. Asfendiar Bhandara and uh, I would introduce you to him and we will, of course, ask him a lot of questions about his life, his overall views about everything, particularly regarding minorities, because we know that he has been a former member of National Assembly and he was the minority specialist for the government. And also we know that he is the chief executive officer of Mari Brewery. So welcome to the program. Thank you for him. Thank you and welcome to Mari Brewery. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Sir, of course, people know you as a politician. People know you as a person who has worked for the minorities. But we will get into that. But first of all, I would like to ask you about your personal life, as in uh, your birth, you were brought up. Where was it? Uh, well, I was born uh, in Karachi, and my my brought up has been in Pindi Islamabad, the Twin Cities, as we call it. Right. And the schooling was here, uh, just uh, um, one year in the in the United States uh, when I was sent to college, which um, I did not really li like staying there alone. You know, uh, I had a childhood amongst a lot of friends and family. So being alone in the United States was a was a curse to to you got homesick exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I so after one year, I l literally ran back to Pakistan to pursue studies over here at uh, <clears throat> at uh, in Islamabad, uh, and uh, and at that time uh, the inclination my natural inclination was to work in the company, mm -hmm. you know, the brewery. So I started. Um, spending time at the brewery more and more and after right after college right after doing my MBA from Islamabad right. and uh, so I started uh, yeah so I had it in the back of my mind that I have to work here so might as well take an early start which was not the right thing to do if you ask me you know getting more experience from outside is all it always helps you so anyway so yes I started uh, in the company I think in 95 96 along with my father and my father was at that time the CEO and I was working with him and he uh, <clears throat> had me grilling uh, in almost all the departments of the company so I did uh, I just just did not land in the CEO's chair I actually worked in most of the departments of the company uh, till his demise uh, in 2008 I was appointed the CEO by the board of Mari Brewery so that's the that's the quick uh, journey to the CEO, right? Uh, yeah. And we always business minded. Well, I think yes. In a, you know, being brought up in a business family with a you know a father who's always telling us <clears throat> not to waste money, mm -hmm. not to waste things, not to waste legacy. So that mind was always there not to be you know extravagant taught you the value of money thought, exactly thank you taught me the value of money and that's how uh, the the personal as well as the business training was now I do the same thing with my kids you know in in try to educate them into doing whatever I was taught uh, by my father so yes uh, business has always been in the in the front uh, front uh, in the front forward right and then when did you get married? I got married in uh, nine, uh, 99. 99. 99, yes. If I might ask, was it a love marriage or an arrangement? Well, it was my, uh, yes, it was my personal choice. And we being Parsis, we, uh, you know, we, ha the, the, we have to, you know, look within the, within, the within the community. Yes, correct. Like any other religion. So, <clears throat> so yes, it was my own liking and uh, not, not, my, not my immediate family, uh, cousin or anything, but uh, my, from the Parsi community, yes. Lovely, lovely. And uh, how many children? Got two boys. Two boys. How old? Uh, they are uh, 19 and 17. 19 and 17, mashallah. That's great. So, um, having a good family life, being married over here, did it ever occur to you that you perhaps want to settle abroad? Well, a lot, I've been asked this question a lot of times, but, uh, you know, 
I've lived a li life of privilege. You know, I, I could have been, you know, not in this place very easily. So, uh, you know, I was lucky to be, uh, you know, have a privileged life. And uh, Pakistan has given <clears throat> everything what my family has. Uh, you know, we have grown over here. We have, we have uh, you know, expanded our business, expanded everything over here in Pakistan. So my father never had a different passport unlike what a lot of people have today. True, true. And I also uh, never thought of any, any, I do have a Dubai residency, mm -hmm. and that's just a residency, but I do not have a different passport and I, one does not really want it. You know, uh, the way sometimes we are ungrateful of, of our country, but the... Uh, the Actually a, a lot of times. A lot of times, yeah. yeah. So once you go abroad, and you find yourself as a really second or third class citizens. And over here in Pakistan, you know, yes, it, it's ha it has its um, downsides to it. And every, which community, which country doesn't. True, true. S so uh, apart from all the negativities, I think uh, living in Pakistan is, uh, is a blessing. We are all free Pakistanis. And, uh, you know, we are having a good business and Pakistan is a thriving economy. We have a big population over here, 200 million plus customers in Pakistan. In the, the, the food and beverage business we are in. And uh, so, yeah, so, yep, no second thoughts about that. <laughs> and uh, I would, before I get into the details of your personality, I would like you to share with the viewers and us something that your father taught, a line or something very inspirational that you still think about and you still follow that in your life? Good question, Fahim. Um, well, every day, you know, he, he, we had a more of a teacher-parent, a teacher-student uh, relation. So every day was a lesson. So one of the lessons that I did uh, pick up, thank thankfully, and I do use it, is that uh, honesty. Uh, you know, uh, is the best, easiest policy. You know, that's how we work in the company, honesty and without uh, trying to trick the government or any. So, you know, things really are easy when you're not hiding anything, when you are focused, when your, your goals are very clear, when your intentions are very clear, you don't have any <clears throat> skeletons in the closet as they say. So I think honest, I would, I would uh, amongst, amongst many things, uh, I would pick up, pick up honesty. Not only honesty in business, honesty with the employees, honesty with the shareholders, honesty with, with, with thy own self. So I think, uh, and um, it really helped me. It really helped me in personal life also as well as the company life. One thing that you mentioned earlier that uh, you wish that you hadn't started working in your own company. Can yes. you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, I will. You see, my son is now uh, studying abroad and I would not like him to just jump off the university into the company because you see, getting that, getting that experience where you are not the son of the, you're not the privileged son of the CEO. <clears throat> you're not entitled. You, exactly. So I think I missed that. I, those were different times. The demand was not there, either by, by my father or, you know, even my interest was not there. But now when you look at the competitive, and when you look at the competitive edge market, now I think that I would really hope that my, um, you know, sons do uh, try to get a first-hand experience working somewhere else, where there is no daddy to, pro to protect them. So, and I, I definitely, uh, I will make sure this happens, that they do get pick up some experience from the market. And that's an excellent uh, decision, I must say, because I, I, that's how the children learn the value of money, when they work themselves, when they become self-confident and uh, they, they start sustaining their own selves. Yes, that's, that's a good decision, I must say. Now, uh, then later on, when did it occur to you that you wanted to come into politics? Well, it was purely by accident, and a, a, a friend of uh, a friend of mine, 
you persuaded me I, well to be honest you know a, a politics was not my forte you know it's not something like i yearned for so but anyhow uh, i met me and nawaz sharif at his residence at jati umrah back in 2012 if i'm not mistaken and uh, since he had my father was also in politics so i had that small edge that he was also in politics he was also at one time in the majlis e shura when uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif was the CM of Punjab, and and my father was the Minister of Minorities at that time. So, so the introduction was already there to me, Asa, and that's how I got the ticket and became MNA from 2013 to 2018 in the last assembly. So, um, of course, uh, like you were telling us, that's how you got the ticket. Uh, before we get into the details of you being the minister, uh, member of the National Assembly, we would also like to know whether you also had some other interests. Like everyone has interests. For example, I love singing. I've learned singing. I do my riyas and everything. So, like, what were your interests besides the business activities? Well, uh, personal interests. Uh, I, I I like to read books. Uh, not ancient history. but the more contemporary more what's happening more um, in the middle east and in our part of the world <clears throat> vis a vis kashmir bangladesh palestine china america cold war so i i like i like to read books on these and i also have a, a passion a collection of uh, old vintage cars and um, and old cars which uh, you know you have to work on not to the ready made japanese cars but the really cars you have to put your labor inside so i do have an old collection of cars from the 1960s to 1970s to 1980s and 1990s so i'm sure my producer would agree that we would like to go there watch it and record it yes sure. um so Yes, we're going to do that later on. But now, then, when you get into politics, did you ever have an idea that you are going to work for the minority community? Yes. Well, of course. Uh, no matter what we do, is still less for the minor minorities of Pakistan. And uh, I, I, we, we didn't really get a lot of um, movement in funds, unfortunately, and because a lot of you know. other than talk a lot of funding is required to do a lot of things for the minorities you know to to for the repairs of their worship places to making community centers getting water connection getting gas connection so i was able to do very little unfortunately and every government in pakistan i'm not i'm not i won't take any names of any government mm -hmm. but uh, every government claims that they are minority friendly which i would slightly respectfully beg to differ that they 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 all can do more and i'm not talking as a as a representative of the of pmln mm -hmm. i'm talking as a pakistani minority that i'm a pakistani non muslim and a lot can be done uh, uh, for uh, uh, like for example jobs a lot of jobs should be created for minorities protection forced marriages forced conversions all these things have to be curtailed and over here i blame i blame not any government i blame over here the our the law enforcement i would i would put my finger on and i put my finger on the on the judiciary that the laws for the protection of minorities are already there our own constitution of pakistan you don't need to do anything if you look at our own constitution of pakistan it gives you guaranteed rights for the non muslims then what is the problem the problem is the implementation and no prime minister or no minister it's not their job this is the job of the local of the local administration for example i always tell that if the local area sho or if the or, or if your judges are more friendly or understanding the problems of minorities then you don't need any anything else you see 
जो वट एवर प्रॉब्लम्स दैट वी मनॉरिटीज हैव कैन ईजिली बी सॉल्व बाय द लोकल पुलिस सेटअप द लोकल एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन और द लोकल योर द लोकल कोर्ट्स यू डोंट नीड वी डोंट नीड एनी स्पेशल कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट और एनी प्राइम मिनिस्टर टू कम डाउन ऑन टेलीविजन एंड टॉक अबाउट मनोरिटीज वी डोंट नीड एनी ऑफ दैट आई एम जस्ट डाउन ग्रेडिंग द प्रॉब्लम टू अ वेरी टू अ वेरी डाउन लेवल दैट द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ लोकल कन्वर्जन फोर्स कन्वर्जन किडनेपिंग and all the other ills which which are which the minorities face can successfully and easily be dealt by the police and by the judiciary you're right implementation does happen implementation to be one government. of the greatest problems yes. in the country you're right and i think the government is uh, working on that too the ministry of human rights is working on that and uh, of course the minority uh, minister is working on that we know we have seen that happening uh, in the previous government as well but then again like you you very rightly mentioned that every government no government is perfect as we say they all have their own flaws but we do see something or the other happening i will just add over here you see having the respect love would be a far cry but just ha- having the mutual respect for a different religion a religious uh, person of different religion requires a change in your mentality that uh, that's how you were brought up in your home what were you taught by your teachers and by your parents now that's you don't need any prime minister or any mna or minister to uh, inculcate that thinking into your mind for the respect and honor of minorities as this human. as a you this has to come through education i've said this a lot of times that uh, we are always waiting for a messiah एक प्राइम मिनिस्टर आएगा एक मिनिस्टर आएगा एक प्रेसिडेंट आएगा वी हैव गॉट टू स्टॉप डूइंग दैट वी हैव टू चेंज अवर सेल्स वी हैव टू बी मोर रिस्पॉन्सिबल वी हैव टू बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर अवर ओन टैक्स चोरी टैक्स पेलफ्रिज अवर ओन पोल्यूटिंग द एनवायरमेंट यू नो सो दिस ऑल कम्स इन माई ओपिनियन फ्रॉम द बेसिक लैक ऑफ एजुकेशन सो एजुकेशन आई वुड से इज द रूट कॉज ऑफ all evil and the people who don't want kids to be educated i can understand very easily now why they don't want because once you get education proper education then you learn the, the to respect the values of your neighbor of your friends of people of other faiths so i think uh, uh, this is not a job of the government or any prime minister or any minister or any any mna to put that basic common sense into the person's mind that's for, true that's true for respecting or whatever for the minorities it has to come inside you and uh, besides that i mean we do see that literacy is there but education is not yes the- because education starts at home correct e- education starts at home yes yeah and we also have seen how the minority community has contributed so much to the state of pakistan be the healthcare system be the education system especially the christian community christian seen community that. correct correct and yeah yes parsi community of my community has also you know apart from the christian community the parsi mm-hmm. community has also the some of the educational institutions in karachi i see ah uh, by uh, i'm not sure which names uh, uh, the, the mama parsi school and um, i'm forgetting the names right now but they have done their bit um, for the education and for the health uh, and parsis are known to do philanthropy quietly that's the difference you see they don't want to come on the television and say they are feeding which is beautiful you know uh, we are feeding this and we are making a hospital they will do everything under the sun the parsis of india and pakistan are known for for their philanthropy but they'll do it quietly no one would even know that they're doing it and so so i think um, parsis have really done a lot uh, in terms of health 
and in terms of education. I think the basic spirit of philanthropy is that you have to do it quietly. Uh, well, I, yes, that's how one should do it. Yeah. Without advertising it. <laughs> true, true. Because uh, you give alms in charity, you advertise it. What's the, what's the use? What's the use, exactly. Right. Yeah. That is unfortunately the trend in Pakistan. That is. Yeah, I, I had to say that. <laughs> No, we also see that uh, abroad as well, but we do see that more here, especially with the, the social media We're highlighting each and every thing, each and every action of every person every day. So, yeah, yeah. people take advantage of that and use it, exploit it. Now, um, you were telling me about um, your business. Have you tried to expand your business in the last couple of years? Well, that's... That's what I've been doing since I took over from in 2008. Uh, it's with what now, thir um, 14 years that right. always trying to do something new, make a new product and enhance the value of the company, increase our portfo the portfolio of the products. So always, uh, there's never been a year in which we have not added a new machine or a new building or a new product or a new thought so always uh, on the move and have you gone international during this period well we have uh, no not really we are exporting our products and a lot of times you see um, I'm uh, alone you know I, I don't have any help from any siblings so and uh, well there's so much growth uh, in pakistan and there is so much growth for him that uh, you know uh, we are still i would we are just on the we're not doing much we are just on the tip of the iceberg what what i'm trying to tell you is that i don't need to put up a factory uh, anywhere else uh, we need to put up it in pakistan which i have and the and the market is very rewarding over here I'll, I'll, I'll just give you some examples without any names, of course. There, we have multinational beverage companies, our competitors working in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They enjoy one of the highest sales in a country like Pakistan. You know, people say, oh, when you open up CNN or anything, oh, you hear all bad news about Pakistan. But if you ask all the multinationals working in Pakistan, it, for them, it's a windfall in profits and in sales. So what I'm trying to tell you, tell our view, that's viewers new. over here. I didn't know that. No, sir. It's a very reward, rewarding market, and the there's a you know group population explosion. Unfortunately, the youth we have a big, we have a 60 percent I think uh, under the age of 30, yes. young population eating, drinking. So I think it's a very rewarding market, and before uh, putting up something abroad is not on the on my hot burner. But expanding in Pakistan is definitely, yes. Lovely. Yeah. And uh, do we have factories uh, uh, outside of uh, Rawalpindi? Yes. Of, yeah. I was in fact there today. On Thursdays, I go to uh, uh, Hatar, uh, the KP area. We have a couple of units over there. But the head office is right here, uh, right next to the uh, Army Chief's house, the, the Murray Brewery Estate. And so... Um, so yeah, that's where I sit. And since how long has this Murray Brewery State been here? Well, originally, originally, um, this per this property was purchased um, by the management of Murray Brewery when it was not in the family by Maharaja Hari Singh of Kashmir, which which includes the army residence and the Murray Brewery where where we are sitting right here today. So the brewery shifted to Rawalpindi in 1890. It was established in 1860. It, they transferred a lot of, uh, because of they were expanding, so they needed big flat space. So from Murray Hills, they came to Rawalpindi in 1890, 1900. And at that time, the army residence and the whole Murray brewery area was one. And the Murray, the, the Charles Wimper, the, the British chairman, of that time, they bought uh, this piece of land from Maharaja Hari Singh, uh, the, the Maharaja, the ruler of Kashmir. Kashmir. Yes, yeah. So in 1947, my, my grandfather was working with the, with the Gora management 
So my grandfather took over, the, bought over the majority shares of Murray Brewery at the time of partition in 1947. That's how it came in the family in 1947. That's lovely. And also, um, we have a book lying here, and uh, we would like to know more about this yes. book. Yes, this is, uh, uh, we, we, Murray Brewery commissions a book every two, three years. And uh, first it was the Kalash up in the valley uh -huh. on the Kalasha. The dying Kalasha, and the second one was uh, on Rawalpindi, uh, the city of Ra the old historic account old, of right. old Rawalpindi, with the you know R A U, the old spelling or what. And uh, this one is uh, on the religions of Pakistan, all the ten religions of Pakistan. It's a beautiful book, done by Dr. Amina Hoti. She's a family friend, and this is a book uh, available in the market, and it depicts all the religions of Pakistan and my main target is people who say that Pakistan <coughs> people who have a very narrow view of Pakistan this is a book in their face that you know read this book and so Pakistan is a vibrant and, pluralistic and the title country. is so beautiful Gems Gems and Jewels, and Jewels. yes yes lovely lovely and also uh, sir we would like to know about your aunt she is an established writer yes. uh, a huge name in the field of literature, I must say. Uh, tell us something about her. Well, I'm, I'm proud that Babsi Sidwa is my popo, my aunt. Uh, unfortunately, she's not faring very well with health. She lives in America, uh, migrated to America <clears throat> since, dec I think, two decades, three decades. I see. She lives in Houston, and she used to come to Pakistan. She used to be get invited to Pakistan uh, to make speeches on her book and talk about her book and one of her books um, ice candy man uh -huh. uh, or is it the crow it is one of the books got into a movie also in india by the name of earth 1947 earth 1947 amir khan which is all about partition it's her babsi sidwa's personal experiences of the partition the horrifying experiences of the partition which are in in that movie yeah so yes, so she's uh, there and she's also recognized by the government of Pakistan. She's got that uh, Satarai, uh, one yes. of Satarai Imtiaz for the performing arts, I think they give it to the art. So yes, so we are very proud of her and may God give her good health. Amen, Amen. Sir, we would like to see your collection of cards. Sure, sure, Shall definitely. Let's, let's, let's roll. Let's roll. <laughs>
So we can all see what the Modi Modi led government is doing to all to mostly all its minorities. So which is very sad. So you know the world also needs to the West especially needs to open up its eyes. Uh, I, I've written a few times to the Time magazine that the Time magazine is always crying about the the Uyghurs of China, you know, and and you know highlighting their problems, but I yet have to see an article, zero articles on the plight of Kashmiris. Uh, so, so this is a very biased world we are living in, and uh, you know, so we have to do what's right. True. We have to do what's right. We don't have to follow anyone else, and the world should. And uh, I hope history judges us, and the world judges uh, judges us. Uh, I whenever when I was M N A, I always used to say that um, I still believe in this that the respect and the security of Pakistan it lies in how we treat our women, our minority, and our downtrodden. That's where the real strength of Pakistan lies. How people perceive us. If they see us as hooligans, mm. so naturally the response will be uh, the same. But if they see us as a mature country, uh, so of course all door, all doors of uh, economic doors or whatever types of doors open up. So I think by respecting your uh, minorities is is very important for the respect and security of Pakistan. Now. Um uh, of course, you were a member of the National Assembly, and uh, you do have that political eye. Uh, how would you comment on the current regional politics uh, of Asia? Of Asia, okay. Well, uh, I hope uh, our uh, I hope there is peace uh, with our eastern as, as well as our western neighbour. We need to strengthen ourselves economically. And within Pakistan, we need to concentrate our energies within Pakistan. Right. Yeah. Also, uh, you have two sons. Do you, uh, have they ever expressed the desire to get into politics? Well, well, they're too young right now. And uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a bit, a bit too early uh, in the day to ask this question. <laughs> but still, I mean, have you ever had that discussion, especially well, when you were the member of National Assembly, did they ever show a desire that perhaps they want to be like you? Like, look, I always, they, all, they also know that politics does not feed your stomach. Mm -hmm. If you're in politics to feed your stomach, so then you're in the wrong profession. Then, you know, then you, you will do bad. You, then you will, that's the wrong profession. So first of all, any, I would not recommend politics. And first, you, they need to be good human beings get good quality education, earn a living. Once they've earned a living, then one can always look at politics. But if your main maqsad is that I will go to the money, unfortunately, that what we see, then that's wrong. So first you need a good education. You should have a hunar, a trade in your hand. You should be doing, you should know something other than politics. And then, yes, when you have achieved certain income of your family, well, whatever, then you can always plunge into, uh, plunge into politics. Right. But politics should not be taken as a zariya amdan, your source of income. Right. And also, um, like you, you've been doing philanthropic work, your community has been doing philanthropic work. Uh, has that passed on to the next generation? Well, I, when they see me doing it, and I make sure they see me, my kids, uh, doing whatever I do, and I would not like to dwell into that. And yes, I've seen them also pick up, uh, you know, a few things from, from me, and they also, the, while we are sitting in an AC car, they should feel the pain of that wala or that beggar. They should not brush it away. Hmm. So I see that. I see that in my kids, that pain, that question, that thought for that man, which is a good thing. So you're raising so them I, as emotionally intelligent I, I think people. that's a, a credit, I would say, one good point for me. If they, are, they, if they can feel that, uh, if they can see themselves privileged and see the other person and they should help. So I think I've, I've done something good. And um, 
What's the contribution of your wife in your success, in your career, in the overall philanthropic works that you do and all the achievements that you have gathered for yourself so far? Look, wives are the mainstay. Uh, you know, they, they put the house in order. Uh, they put the kids, the wife. The, 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 I think the woman folk in our country are uh, underplayed. Uh, they underappreciated, and I think they, they, have, they play a role in their own quiet way. They play a role in their own quiet way, and uh, my wife is a homemaker. And so they all, I think um, they all take the worries into their own pocket, the, the wives, which is, you know, which is a blessing, unlike the Western, where, where, the, where the wives are professionals. You know, you do your own laundry, and you do your own cooking, and I'll see you at night. So unlike in our society, they take all the burden into their own uh, pocket. And when, once we come home, everything is laid out to us, which is, a, I think, is a blessing. And, and one can say thank you to the be better half. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And also, um, I see that uh, you do have immense love for the culture of uh, Pakistan and Pakistani society. And uh, uh, I, I do see that. Uh, but do your children, because they belong to a different generation. The right? iPhone generation. The iPhone generation. So do they share the same love? Well, when I was, when I was their age, probably not. But I think, um, I think uh, the teen years are the, are the most careless, carefree years. So I, I'm pretty sure uh, under my tutelage and under my watch, uh, um, I, one can always hope for the, for, you know, but, but I think uh, they will uh, appreciate what history, what the legacy is in the family and, uh, and also how to appreciate and protect histo uh, history and historic things and, and be more cultured and not to be a flamboyant, um, uh, you know, uh, a carefree playboys. And I, I, I see that because that's what, how, I, how I've slowly but surely uh, uh, put in them. You know? Right. Yeah. And also, um, do you like to travel? Because uh, according to what I see in the room, in the office, I think you do like to travel a lot. Well, uh, yes, uh, I like to travel. And they say that traveling really broadens one's horizon and one should travel if they can. Even if they can't, one should save up and bring up the means to travel wherever they can. Have you made your children travel with you? Yes, they, yes uh, they are. one is studying abroad. Mm. And yes, traveling itself is a learning experience. You're right. That's true. Sir, it was an amazing experience coming here, uh, talking to you about different things, philanthropy, politics, your own personal life, your children, your wife. So thank you very much for being with us, for giving us your time and uh, speaking about so many aspects and different spheres of life. Thank you very much. You're most welcome and thank you for coming over here it's and giving me a chance to express my views. It's thank been you. a pleasure. It's thank you. A pleasure. It's been a pleasure, sir. Well, this was Mr. Expendiar Bhandara viewers. I'm sure, like us, you people also must have really enjoyed his company because we got to know a lot from him and we got to learn a lot from him. And I'm sure we will keep on bringing you more and more people from whom we can learn, from whom you can learn, because such people make a difference. Such people add value to the country, to the society that they're living in. Keep watching BTV World. Stay tuned to BTV World. Allah Hafiz.